we're looking at the uh, book of Jonah. Now, Jonah is a teaching we did some time ago, and it's available in print and transcript, and it's available in audio, but not in video. But we don't want to reinvent the wheel or do the same thing we did some years ago. We want to do a different version of it with the highlighting of aspects not including in the earlier one, but we still point people back to the original one done some years ago, about 10 years ago, because that also will contain some material not in this evening's presentation at the word for the weekend. But above all, and first of all, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness, for your kindness, for your mercy. We thank you for the blood of your Son that cleanses from all sin. We thank you, Lord, for the cross, for your Holy Spirit, and for the eternal truths of your word, for the promise of your Son's return, the rapture, the resurrection, the millennial kingdom, and the glories of eternity. Lord God, we earn none of these things. Your Son earned them by taking our sin to give us his righteousness and dying our death to give us his life. We praise you and thank you, Lord God. Keep us faithful unto him until that day. In his name, the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I don't know why it is, but someone uh, somewhere uh, thought it's, you know, it's Motzei Shabbat. It's the end of the Jewish Sabbath. So perhaps we should have a, a, a Sabbath prayer in Hebrew. I don't know. It's not the thing I would normally do on a, a Saturday night unless I'm in Israel, but I will happy to oblige anyone who wants to join me in a Hebrew prayer. I know we have some listeners staying up very late past midnight in Israel. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Jonah, please. We'll begin by reading it. It's not a very big book. I've looked at it in Hebrew today for the first time in some time, but we will look at it now, please, the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, to the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found the ship which was going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down onto it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm in the sea, that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to, the, to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. This, of course, reminds us of the shipwreck of St. Paul in Acts 27, and has similar imagery. But Jonah had gone down below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was a 
he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us. But you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days days and three nights. I just have to beg your grace for 20 seconds. I'm going to need some reading glasses. All right, 19 seconds. Let's continue. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish and said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, you heard my voice, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again towards your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the root of the mountain. The earth with its bars were around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. Notice the sea is compared to the pit. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put the a sack on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And when the word of the Lord reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, he laid aside his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and the nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and let them call on God earnestly, that each one may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. And when he saw their deeds, that they re re returned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, 
Was not this what I said while I was still with you in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And the Lord said, Do you have a good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city to the east of it. There he made a shelter for himself, and he sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant, but God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all of his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and left? as well as many animals. Quite a story. Too often a children's bedtime story alone or a Sunday school lesson. <coughs> but there is, of course, much more to it. We're going to begin looking at this saga from several aspects. The first will be, obviously, it's Sitzenleben, its historical and cultural setting and Jonah in that setting. That will be preliminary. Then we're going to look at the messianic typology, the messianic typology of Jonah, which is found highlighted in Matthew 12 and Luke 11. Then we're going to look at <coughs> the prophetic imagery, the prophetic imagery of Jonah. And finally, we're going to look at the homily, the exhortation that is for us in this very famous story that again has too often been reduced to a children's story, <clears throat> but it's much more important than that. Jesus made it clear it was much more important than that. Let us begin. Jonah, Yonah means dove in Hebrew, dove. It's not exactly the same species as the turtle dove that was sacrificed, but we know that Jonah is here, the name dove, and he appears in conjunction with water, with water. Notice the other times, essentially, when a dove appears, it appears with water in Scripture. The Song of Solomon, Solomon describes his lover as having the eyes of a dove. What is curious about doves is they are a monogamous bird. They only have eyes for their mate and not for another. Hence, Solomon is making this kind of comparison. And if we look at the uh, typological interpretation of the Song of Solomon as being not only Solomon and Shulamit, but representative of Christ in the church, we see that God is a jealous God and Jesus loves his bride and wants a bride for himself and for none other. So we have this idea of the dove. But in the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove when the water is there. <clears throat> Similarly, in the eighth chapter of Genesis, we see in the saga of Noah, the dove associated with water. First, Noah dispenses a non-kosher bird, a bird that Moses would later say was unclean, a raven. Yes, the ravens fed Elijah, but they were unclean birds. And the raven goes off and here and there, nothing. The dove goes... And when the dove goes out, first it finds nothing and returns, 
But when it's dispensed the second time, seven days later, it goes out and comes back with the olive branch. Again, a picture, obviously, of the Holy Spirit. What we also notice in that story of, of Noah compared to Jonah is the 40 days, the 40 days. Nineveh had 40 days to, to, to its judgment, and it rained 40 days and 40 nights in judgment in Genesis 8. So we see the dove, we see the water, we see the time frame, and we see a hero figure going through the water, be it Jonah or Noah, both of them fit into this pattern. So too, we see the dove associated with water at the baptism of the Lord Jesus. Now, let's continue looking at this. Sometime between 814 and 783 BC, we know that there was a king of Assyria named Adad Nariri III, Adad Nariri III, who appears to have embraced the God of Israel. He certainly monotheized, and he brought about a radical moral reform in his city-state, in his kingdom. He brought about a form of repentance and monotheism. This is likely what happened with Jonah. Now, Jonah prophesied during the time of Jeroboam. We'll come back to this in a moment. But we do have historical reference that there was actually a monotheistic reform that took place in Nineveh, the capital city-state of the Assyrian Empire. Now, when we read the book of Nahum, judgment was pronounced against Egypt and against Assyria. But it was delayed. The judgment was delayed because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. It later did transpire at a future time. But what became of the Assyrians since, after they were conquered by the Persians in fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy and Isaiah's prophecy? Prophets Isaiah and Daniel both predicted that the Persians um, under Cyrus the Great would conquer the Assyrians and execute judgment on the Assyrians for their atrocities, including the Assyrian captivity of the ten northern tribes and colonizing northern Israel. Be that as it may, let's understand this. The Assyrians of today are largely a Christianized population. They have a form of Catholicism, and most of these people have faced very difficult times under Islamic persecution from Al-Qaeda and from other elements of Islam, certainly from uh, ISIS. But there's also a conspicuous contingent of evangelicals, particularly Pentecostals. There are diasporic Assyrians. I once was invited to speak at an Assyrian Pentecostal church in Australia, and I've known Assyrian Christians in Israel. They speak still Aramaic, uh, and some of them can read the Syriac alphabet. Linguistically, they are important because their language is the closest spoken language we have, the things like the Peshitta text that gives linguists a clue as to the underlying language of Jesus that was put into the, into the Greek text of the New Testament. So they're still around. Their language is important in biblical scholarship, and they have had a very, very difficult time. It is rather hypocritical that last week the Pope went and paid homage to the Shia Muslims who persecute the Assyrian Christians in Iraq only last week. Where was he five years ago and ten years ago when most of them were being driven out or even killed? Of course, those are the Catholic Assyrians. What about the Pentecostal and evangelical ones? Nobody really says much about them, except God does. So they are still with us. Their language, somewhat evolved, is still with us. And when I was with them and praying with them, it's, it's very... Uh, acutely close to Hebrew. Even now, when they pray in, in, in Aramaic, like I remember them saying the Lord's Prayer and things like this in Aramaic, 
how close it was to the Hebrew version of the Lord's Prayer, Avinu Sheba Shemaim Yitka Deshimcha, etc. It was quite close. If you listen very closely, you could understand most of what they were saying if you know Hebrew. Interesting people. And it's interesting that although their forebearers came under God's judgment, they have descendants who have become Christians, and a number of them born-again Christians, howbeit terribly persecuted ones, some of them still in the Middle East to this day, but of course they need prayer. Let us move on and look forward. So this actually happened somewhere between 814 and approximately 783. We know that this actually did take place, but let's look further at Jonah, whose name, of course, meant a dove and what it spells in terms of its prophetic importance. Jonah did not begin prophesying to the Ninevites. Jonah had a mission first to his own people. Jonah was from Gat Hefer. Gat Hefer. Gat Hefer is literally, literally in walking distance from Nazareth. In John chapter 7, when the Sanhedrin said, no prophet comes from Galilee. They were wrong. Jonah did. He came from Gat Hefer. Gat Hefer is very close, as in walking distance close, from Nazareth. That's where Jonah was from. And, of course, Jonah did have a message and a ministry from Gat Hefer to the people and to the royalty of the ten northern tribes before the captivity. Following his rejection, following the rejection of Jonah and his message by the Jews, Samaria was destroyed about 70 years later, thereabout, it was destroyed by the Assyrians, these same Assyrians. But before these Assyrians came and destroyed, God was already looking at their salvation, even though they were a much feared nation who used not only warfare, but siege. In other words, starvation as a military weapon. The use of starvation, laying siege and starving a civilian population into submission was, as far as we know, first invented by the Assyrians. They were very cruel warriors. <clears throat> but it will remind us of the way the Jews were hemmed up in the Warsaw Ghetto or what happened in 70 AD with Josephus. These are the Assyrians, yet God was still concerned for their salvation at one point. Their judgment was written by Nahum, but God was willing to relent if they were willing to repent. This is part of the reason that the book of Jonah is read in the synagogues to this day on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. It has a focus on God's willingness to forgive even the most atrocious of sinners, of his willingness to be gracious and forgiving if there is a genuine repentance, even to the point of people who are guilty of the unspeakable, of a pagan society. So it happens. Now let's understand this a bit further. We have Jonah, and we have Jonah as a type of Christ, a type of Christ. Turn with me, please, to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 12. He warns those who are seeking a sign. A wicked and adulterous generation does that. It's wicked and adulterous people who go to Benny Hinn crusades looking for a miracle instead of going to Jesus. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment, and will condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. 
the queen of the south, that's Mark Yisheva, the queen of Sheba, will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. <clears throat> Jesus spoke of the sign of the prophet Jonah. But notice something. First of all, obviously, it's, it's not translated well. In modern Hebrew, well is generally called Leviathan, but Leviathan was not what a whale was actually in the Hebrew scriptures, most probably. Whales are not even normally indigenous to the Mediterranean. But there it is. So what we see is this. Jesus gives two related, yet very different interpretations to the same scripture, the sign of Jonah. <clears throat> The rabbis in the time of Jesus taught that there are multiple interpretations of the scripture, and Jesus was a rabbi. The Western Evangelical Protestant Church, however, has unfortunately invented some of its own rules in hermeneutics and exegesis uh, that come from 16th century humanism and from the ideas of man, not the word of God, but they teach them and hold them in their ignorance as if they were sacrosanct. I pointed this out a number of times, but it fits this passage, so I need to say it again. They say, and they teach in their Bible colleges and seminaries, or at least they used to, that there are many applications of a scripture, but only one interpretation. There are many applications, but only one interpretation. Well, as we see, this is complete and utter nonsense invented by Gentile minds who were quite alien from the first century Christians and from Jesus. Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef Minet said it. Now, I'm well aware of the extremes of the Messianic movement and the hyper-Messianic legalists. I'm not promoting the things that go on in the so-called Hebrew Roots movement at all. It's obviously, it's, it, it's saturated with nonsense and legalism. I'm just looking at the scriptures. What is the sign of Jonah? Well, one, it's three days and three nights, just like Lazarus, foreshadowing Christ, three days and three nights in the tomb. We deal with the three days and three nights on our teaching on the book of Amos, chapter 7 and 8. It was it a Friday, was it a Thursday? How could he raise on a Sunday? We explain that in our teaching on the book of Amos. However, for purposes now, Jesus said what happened with Jonah is a type or a shadow of what will happen with him. And we see that when the people of Israel would not repent at his preaching in the days of Jeroboam, God sent him to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles repented when the Jews would not. Then Samaria was destroyed. The same kind of thing happened with Jesus. The Gentiles accepted him when most Jews would not, and Jerusalem was destroyed and so forth. Same pattern is a type of Christ, but the sign, the Gentiles would believe when the Jews generally would not. And he reinforces this by linking it to the Queen of Sheba coming to hear Solomon. The Gentiles will rise up and condemn this generation of unbelieving Jews. Now, I do not say this with any anti-Semitic intent. My wife and children are Israeli Jews. Uh, my family are Jewish. I don't ha obviously have anything negative in, in the sense of anti-Semitism to say, but they rejected their own Messiah. And of course, now the church has gone into an apostasy that's even worse than Israel. The Gentile church has become as apostate as of Christians from the nations, but just as Judaism went into apostasy, so has the church. Nonetheless, let's look at this. Non-Jews would believe when Jews didn't. That's one sign. Three days and three nights, the resurrection. In the depths of Sheol, as it were, that's another. 
Now, the appearance of the term Sheol in the Hebrew text would suggest in the minds of some scholars that Jonah actually died and came back to life, that he actually underwent biological death and came back to life in the stomach of the great fish. Again, with pericardial effusion um, and so forth, autopsies done on cadavers that were executed uh, Roman style, that, but were kept metabolizing on artificial life support systems, determined that Jesus inhaled, uh, inhaled pericardial fluid uh, and, and it got into his respiratory tract and there were other fluids that got into his respiratory tract and drowning was a feature in his death. <clears throat> drowning was a feature in the death of Jesus. So they say there were, his death was cardiopulmonary, essentially, as well as, as, well as um, cardiovascular. It was cardiopulmonary. Uh, so they say <clears throat> if Jesus drowned, indeed, as some patho medical pathologists have suggested, that would, of course, reinforce the idea that Jonah drowned also as a type of Christ. Nonetheless, we see that Jesus gives two entirely different, but two co-valid meanings to the same text. Two different meanings, related, but different. He assigns two different interpretations to the sign of Jonah. And there are multiple other passages in Scripture where the same thing happens. No, it is not one interpretation, many applications. There are multiple interpretations, not mutually exclusive, but in harmony with each other. We need to read the scriptures the way the first century Christians did, not the way the 16th century humanistic Protestant reformers did. They got some things right, but they got some things wrong. The reformers were not the ones who were the revelators of the word of God. The apostles and the Hebrew prophets were, and that must be our priority. Jesus did not follow their rules of interpretation all of the time. Nonetheless, let's now continue. Two different meanings to the same thing. Three days and three nights. So let's begin now looking at Jonah as a type of Christ. These people do not know their left hand from their right hand. They do not know their left hand from their right hand. In Isaiah 53, we are told, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The Hebrew scriptures tell us that Jehovah, Yehovah, Yahweh, will bring salvation with his right hand. <clears throat> it says on the Psalms, If I forget the O Jerusalem, may I forget my right hand. He will bring salvation with his right hand. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The right hand of God is always an Old Testament metaphor for the Messiah, for the Messiah, both as Savior and Creator. The world was made through him. In John 1, Psalm 8, uh, and so forth, the world was made through him. The right hand of Yahweh is the Mashiach, is the Messiah. These people in Nineveh, these pagans, did not know their right hand from their left. Now notice what happens. Jonah was angry, and he was saying, destroy these people who don't know the true God, and, and, and the ones who have idols be against them. <clears throat> notice what happens at the storm at sea. Their own gods fail them, and they turn to Jonah's God and begin to fear him instead. What happens on the ship during the storm? when these Gentiles turn from their pagan way <clears throat> and realize the true power of Jonah's God, the God of Israel, who is your nation, who is your people, who is your God, that God relents. He's the one true God. People who do not understand the God of Israel through Christ do not know their right hand from their left. They do not understand the nature of creation, neither do they understand the nature of true salvation. 
to understand creation and to understand salvation, we must know the right hand from the left. And only the Hebrews knew that initially. Initially. But when Gentiles turned to the Jewish God, then they knew it as well. But let's continue looking further. Jonah as a type of Christ. We see some very interesting things concerning Jonah, don't we? He's asleep in the boat. And the people in the boat are saying, wake up. How can you be like this? How can you not be afraid? Don't you understand what's happening to us? What's going on, Jonah? Don't you even care? Well, does that sound familiar? Of course it does. It's what we see in the gospel narratives and the storms in Mark's gospel and so forth when Jesus was asleep in the boat. As we read in Jonah, they strained at the oars. They strained at the oars. And what did the gospel narrative tell us that these people also did with Jonah? They began to strain at the oars, strain at the oars. We have an older teaching from some years ago on the, on the boats of the Bible, the typology of the boats. And straining at the oars when we're in a storm. Jesus was asleep in the boat. Jonah was asleep in the boat. We could never have victory. We can never have victory over a storm until and unless we have peace in it. The church, a Christian family, a Christian marriage, a Christian, any believer, Jew or Gentile, cannot possibly have victory power over a storm unless they first have the peace of Christ in it. The victory of Christ cannot come until we have the peace of Christ in it. Until we stop straining at the oars and trying to overcome it with our own strength. That doesn't work. In a storm like that, our own strength will absolutely and certainly fail us. So, Jonah's asleep. Jesus is asleep. Now, we're looking at the Old Testament typology and prophecy concerning uh, what happened. Let's look, please, at chapter 69 of the Psalms, or the 69th Psalm. Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I've sunk into the deep mire. There's no foothold. I've come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. I'm weary of crying. My throat is parched. Notice we have this idea of calling out to God when we are drowning. The calling out to God when we are drowning. Let's look at this further. Turn with me, please, to... Psalm 107, verse 29. He caused the storm to be still, so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Power over the storm. Look with me, please, to Psalm 89, verse 9. You rule the swelling of the sea. When its ra waves rise, it is you who stills them. Psalm 93, verse 3. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The flood lift up their pounding waves. It's happened to me twice in my life. I hope it doesn't happen a third time. Once was in Israel, in the Mediterranean, when I got stuck in a rip current and did not at that time know how to get out of one. I know now, but I did not know then. And the other time was in Hawaii where the same thing happened. It is quite terrifying to be dragged out into the ocean further and further 
And the more you swim, the more you expend energy, and it just makes you more and more tired and less able to resist the current. You can't resist it. The way to get out of a rip current is to swim parallel to the shore until you get out of it. Fortunately, in Israel, I made it to a jetty. Fortunately, in Hawaii, somebody was nearby, and I was able to get to a sandbar. But it's very frightening, and it's very dangerous to be in peril of, of death by drowning. It, panic mode doesn't work. You, you can exert as much muscular strength. It doesn't work. No matter how good of a swimmer you are, it doesn't work unless you know how to get out of it, unless you know how to get out of it and how to get someone else out of it. Now, Coast Guards and lifeguards are trained to get people out of rip currents. But when people are stuck in a rip current, the natural response is to strain at the oars, as it were, using their arms as the oars. They're only going into nervous exhaustion. Pretty soon they're going to be taking in salt water and they're going to die. It doesn't work. There's actually techniques that if a lifeguard or a coast guard cannot calm a person down and say, look, you can't get yourself out of this. I've got to get you out of it. You have to trust me to get you out of it. There's a way to knock them unconscious through pressure points, and they actually will, will knock a drowning swimmer or someone who falls off of a vessel or whatever, knock them unconscious so they can save them. You have to understand when you're in that kind of trouble, you can't save yourself. You cannot save yourself. You can be a real good swimmer, but you can't save yourself. Only Jesus can get you out of it. Straining at the oars doesn't work. Trying to swim against the current doesn't work. But what is this really talking about in the full terms of its absolute imagery? Well, let's begin in Psalm 2, verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The nations in an uproar, the people devising a vain thing. Let's go further. Look with me, please, to Psalm 74, verse 23. Do not forget the voice of your adversaries. The uproar of those who rise against you ascends continually. The uproar of those who rise against you ascends continually. The same kind of language, but now let's move to Isaiah chapter 17. Isaiah 17 is the passage that speaks of the destruction of Damascus, Syria. And Isaiah 17, we'll begin in verse 12, please. Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like shaft in the mountains before the wind, or like the whirling dust before a gale. Notice the raging sea, the raging sea in Isaiah and in the imagery of the Psalms is a picture of the uproar of the nations, the uproar of the nations. In the book of Revelation, we have two beasts, one came out of the earth, the other one came out of the sea. There will be an uproar of the nations. Psalm 2 speaks of this. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why is the sea raging against the Lord and his anointed? A storm will come at the close of the age in which the people of God will be rescued. 
and the Lord will take authority over that storm. But the storm is absolutely coming. We must understand in that storm, as in any storm, we must have peace in it before Jesus can give us victory over it. We must understand we cannot rescue ourselves. We have to trust him to rescue us. But this begins not with the experience of believers. It begins with the gospel itself. People who have other gods, people who have other beliefs, who do not know the left hand from the right or the right hand from the left. These people are drowning, are drowning. And the only one who can save them is the God of Jonah, the God of Jonah. Remember, the dove comes to the water in the storm. It's always there. The Holy Spirit must convict of sin and bring about a regeneration. Hence, we see Jonah as a type of Christ sleeping in the boat. But Jonah is willing to be thrown overboard and drown in order to bring salvation to these Gentiles. He gets vomited onto the beach somewhere. And what just happened on the boat is now going to happen in the largest city in the world at that time, in Nineveh. A people he, with good reason, does not like. People of pagan belief, of bad reputation, known for their cruelty and violence. Repeatedly described that way in the Hebrew scriptures. He had good reason. He could not imagine that the God of Israel would have any compassion or desire to save them. Couldn't imagine it. Could not imagine it. So, he wants to go to Tarshish. There are three possible locations of Tarshish, and there may be two places called Tarshish in Scripture. We can't go into that now. We have a teaching called the Ships of Tarshish. But it is not unlikely that this one was the area of the Rock of Gibraltar, known to the Greeks as, later as the Gate of Hercules, the Rock of Gibraltar. Uh, it was the furthest west you could go when you meet the Atlantic and the Great Unknown. It was the end of Mediterranean civilization. You could not go any further in the western direction than Tarshish. Spain, where Spain meets Morocco. You couldn't go any further than that. Uh, in other words, Jonah was trying to get as far away from possible as he could from Assyria. Assyria was on the eastern edge of known civilization, going towards the wilderness of Belushistan. It was on the eastern edge. Tarshish was on the western edge. Now let's begin to understand this further. To recap, we know historically that there was a repentance and that God did relent for a season in Assyria at that time before the prophecies of Nahum ultimately took place. I have known people who willfully follow false prophets, who try to defend false prophets on the basis of Jonah. When you point out the false prophetic predictions that were time-specific, made in the name of the Lord by Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland, or by the Kansas City false prophets, or by Mike Bickle, or by Michael Brown, you can point out, and Cindy Jacobs is another one, you can absolutely document that these people have predictively prophesied falsely in the name of the Lord. We saw that only a few months ago with Pat Robinson and these other people falsely predicting the re-election of Donald Trump. We saw these false prophets. Deuteronomy 18 tells us they are false prophets. They gave time-specific false predictions in the name of the Lord and misled God's people, giving them a false hope, a false belief. They're false prophets, and Jesus said such false prophets will increase. But there are apologists for false prophets, those who try to justify or defend or excuse what they do. We saw this whole thing with, uh, of course, with the uh, 
prophecies of Rick Joyner and, and Che Ahn and, and Bill Johnson and the late Peter Wagner prophesying over Todd Bentley that he's going to lead the Great Revival. And it turns out that he was in an adulterous affair and wound up abandoning his wife and children and so forth. We've talked about this this week in our midweek Bible study. There are people who will try to justify false prophets. When people begin to follow false prophets, you're going to see two things. One, they will try to justify the false prophecies. The only way you can justify a false prophet is to defend their false prophecies somehow. The other thing is they will persecute true prophets or true prophetic voices. They will attack the true prophetic voices in order to defend those who are being used by Satan to mislead the church and to mislead Israel. One of the ways I've seen them do it is this. Oh, well, Jonah got it wrong. When you read the book of Jonah comprehensively, Jonah states directly in chapter 4, when God asks him twice rhetorically, do you have a reason to be angry? Jonah makes it very clear. This is why I didn't want to do this. This is why I didn't like this. Because I knew you would relent if they repented. I knew you would. The text of the book makes it clear that the prophecy was conditional. It was not absolute. Now, there are absolute prophecies that must happen. And there are prophecies that must happen at a specific time. But there are also prophecies where they are conditional, or at least their fulfillment was conditional. Now, the prophecies of Nahum about the ultimate destruction of the Assyrian Empire indeed happened. But they did not happen at the time they were going to because there was a repentance. It is the same now. The judgment of God on the Western world, the backslidden Judeo-Christian world, who, which, who has turned its back on its Judeo-Christian heritage, um, just look at it. The abortion rate in, in, in Christianized countries and in Israel. Uh, under the sins of Manasseh, God would not even forgive this. No, the judgment must come. But repentance can, in theory, delay it. But you reach a point that there is no repentance, as God told Jeremiah, that's it. No more relenting. Now the axe must fall. We always have to be careful when we have a predictive prophecy. Is it time-specific? And is it conditional? If you're saying, the Lord says, if you don't do this, I am going to do that, well, that's one thing. But if you're saying, thus saith the Lord, this is what's going to happen, it's another. No, this was a prophecy that was time-specific, but it was conditional. It was conditional. You cannot justify false prophets on the basis of Jonah. They can only do this by taking the text out of context. And I've heard people from the Vineyard Movement do that. I've heard people from the Vineyard Movement do that. Uh, terrible, but this is it. They pervert the Word of God out of context to justify things the Word of God warns against. But let's continue looking. Well, we have Jonah, and we have the story, we have the epic. So Jonah is also a type of Christ. Gentiles repent when the Jews wouldn't. When he's rejected, the capital is destroyed. First it's Samaria, then of course it would be Jerusalem. That he comes from Galilee, very close to Nazareth. That he is asleep in the boat, and he causes the sea to be calmed. Same as the Lord Jesus. He's a type of Christ. Then we have the prophetic imagery. It is a picture of the raging of the nations. So we have the prophetic imagery, we have the messianic typology, and we have the system name and the history of what actually happened. All that is good, all of that is necessary, all of that is important, but there is at least one further aspect to the saga of the prophet Jonah. 
What is it? In Matthew 16, and I've explained this before, Jesus referred to Peter as Shimon Bar Yonah in Aramaic, the language of the Assyrians. Shimon Bar Yonah, Simon Bar Jonah. Simon the son of Jonah. Could this mean that the biological father of Peter was Jonah? Yes, but he was saying something much more than that. Again, some of you already know this from our other teachings. It was in Jaffa, the ancient port on the south side of the modern city of Tel Aviv, between Ashdod and Ashkelon and, and South Tel Aviv, right on the coast, where King Hiram floated down the cedars of Lebanon <coughs> for the manufacture of the temple. That two very conspicuously similar things happened. It was in Jaffa where Jonah was told in an encounter with the Logos, the word of the Lord came to him, go to the Gentiles. And he didn't want to go. He was prepared to go as far away as he possibly could. He did not want to go to the Assyrians particularly. So he took off and headed for the opposite end of the known world, literally to get away from the calling of God. And coming from Lida, near the modern city of Lod by Lod Airport, Ben Gurion Airport in Israel, Peter comes from there and he comes to Jaffa, to Jaffa, the same exact place as Jonah. And he's there, and the Lord calls him to go to the Gentiles up in Caesarea, to Cornelius and his family. Peter doesn't want to go. Peter does not want to go where the Lord is calling him. He only ate kosher. <laughs> he didn't want anything to do with these Gentiles. Nothing. Well, that's you. And that's I. God has a calling on your life. And he has a calling on my life. We don't all have the same calling. We don't all have the same gifting. But we have the same Lord. And we have the same spirit. And we have the same scriptures. And in order to fulfill the desire of God for our life, we have to. put our own to death. The fish is waiting to eat us. Our own ambition, our own dislike, our own resistance of God. God must deal with that before he can bless us, before he can use us. You see, we're all happy to be used by God on our own terms. Not on his terms. I've told the story many times of my own testimony. I was doing well as a young person in New York financially. I had a very good life and lifestyle, high income, and so forth. And I was active in evangelism among the Jewish community in New York and doing volunteer work with a rescue mission and other things like this. But when the Lord called me to lay it down and go to the Middle East to Israel, I argued and argued and argued. I don't want to do it. I don't want it. I wish I could tell you that I was such a committed believer and I loved the Lord so much. I said, yes, Lord. Like Isaiah, he nanny, here I am. Where do you want me to go? I said, he nanny, as long as it was on my personal list of where I wanted to go. I didn't want to go somewhere else. Well, what does that mean? I experienced the Lord's breaking in my life. He took away my money. He took away my strength. I tried to strain at the oars to get it together. I tried everything I could. I headed for Tarshish in a manner of speaking. But at that time, he wanted me in Israel, not just visiting my girlfriend, who was presently my wife, not just 
financially contributing to Jewish evangelism, not standing in Herald Square in front of Macy's in New York giving out Jews for Jesus broadsides. No, he wanted me to go to Israel to bring the gospel, and I did not want to. Oh, vacation, visit my girlfriend, do a bit of evangelism, that's fine. But to give up my money, to give up my own ambitions, and I had ambitions, no. And it was difficult for me because I had friends who became successful in the pop music industry, and I had offers in, in, in that industry of uh, management and so forth. I could have done very well financially, very well. Um, I don't know if the Lord will ever restore the fortunes of Judah, but it's not what God wanted for me. He saved all of me. He saved all of you. He has a plan and a calling for our lives. We deal with this on our teaching of the book of Esther, but I'll just look at one verse from it very quickly. If you'll turn with me, please, to the epistle to Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter 1, verse 9. who saved us and called us with a holy calling. He saved us and called us with a holy calling. He didn't just save us to go to heaven. He didn't just save us from hell. Oh, he did, praise God. He didn't just save us to co-reign with Christ in the millennium. He did, praise God. He just did not only save us, to share in his eternal glory. Oh, he did, but praise God. But he saved us to fulfill a calling. And as we know, our status in the millennium, our status in the kingdom, will be directly related and proportional to whether or not we fulfilled that calling. Now, there are some things he calls us all to do to lead consecrated lives, to lead moral lives, that's obvious. But I'm speaking in terms of the ministry God has for you. You may not be in full-time ministry, but you are a minister. God has something for you to do. And it may very well clash with your own ideas and your own ambitions. And if you are a person of means or a person of education, it almost certainly will clash. The Lord is going to send a big fish to eat you. And he's not going to spit you out until you call out to him in desperation. A storm will come into your life. You'll try to get out of it in your own strength. You'll try to swim out of it. You'll try to strain at the oars. It won't work. The only thing that's going to work is death to self. The fish is going to swallow you up. Swallowed me up. Anybody I know who the Lord used was in the belly of the whale at some point, if you want to use the term. And in desperation, all right, I'll do anything you want. Get me out of here. At that point, the great fish, the sea monster, regurgitates. There you are, covered with gook, but like Isaiah, ready to say, he named me, send me. Then he goes to Nineveh. Then I went to Israel. Then you'll go to wherever God sends you, but it's not necessarily a different geographical location or a mission field. It may be. It may be that you're a young pastor and God's calling you to a different church in the inner city or a difficult place, somewhere you don't want to go, and frankly, I don't blame you. Jonah had good reason. He could not understand God's compassion for those people. I can understand 
a love for Israel and the Jews. I can relate to that subjectively. I have a burden for the salvation of Jewish people. I can understand a burden for the salvation of all kinds of people. My hatred of Roman Catholicism is in large part because of my love for Roman Catholics. I do not hate Catholicism because I hate Catholics. I hate Catholicism, first of all, because it's, a, it's false and it's a front to God and it's idolatry and superstition. But I also hate it because it leads Catholic people away from the true gospel and the way of salvation. My hatred, I can say honestly before the Lord to you, that my hatred of Roman Catholicism or of liberal Protestantism or Eastern Orthodoxy or of Talmudic Judaism, Rabbinism, is because of my love for the people who are in it. But uh, that love has its limits in human terms. I lost relative September 11th in New York. I've seen terrorist attacks in Israel that were, I could have been killed or my family could have been killed if we'd been there a few minutes earlier. Terrible things. Is my hatred for Islam based on my love for Muslims? That's been a struggle in my life. I've been attacked by Muslim gangs in London for preaching the gospel, physically attacked. But you know, just uh, yesterday, I watched a interview by the apologist David Wood. David Wood is a great apologist, especially in Islamic evangelism. Uh, the other one I, I, you know, I really love is is, is the person who he had with him, uh, Jay Jay Smith. They've done things together sometimes, and there's a wonderful sister saved out of Islam. Uh, called Hatun. Uh, she's wonderful also. But they interviewed this Coptic clergyman from Egypt. Now, the Coptic church is a bit of a problem for me because they have icons and things like that. But I led a Coptic guy to the Lord once in, in Egypt, in Cairo, and I've met Coptic Christians, young people, who I'm sure were born again. I have no doubt and I have no doubt that this priest who they interviewed, or the Coptic clergyman who they interviewed, his name is uh, Zachariah uh, uh, Boutros, is a true believer. And he's one of the most notoriously effective apologists against Islam imaginable. Arabic is his mother tongue. But he says... I don't attack Islam to attack Islam or to attack Muslims. I do it that they may come to know Jesus and be born again. His hatred for Islam, for the teachings of Muhammad and the hatred for the Quran and the Hadith is because he has the burden of Christ to see Muslims saved. I've struggled with that. And I still do. But you know, in South Africa, there's a few Muslims who came to Christ through my ministry. In New Zealand, there's a family of wonderful believers. She is originally from Iran, who came to faith. The father was brought by one of the daughters who'd gotten saved, came to hear me speak at a Baptist church in Auckland, New Zealand. The father got saved. I haven't led a lot of Muslims to Christ but by the grace of Jesus, I have led some to Christ. And they bring me a tremendous sense of blessing. But they also bring me a tremendous sense of shame and conviction. Because I've harbored hatred in my heart for Muslims after September 11th. And after things I've seen in Israel. I had a son in the Israeli army, and I don't want to go into it now, but... These believers have so much of Jesus in them. The best Christians I've ever met in my life are people truly saved out of Islam. I must say that. 
the best Christians, saved Christians I've ever met in my life are people who've been saved out of Islam. Any of them are Arabs, Abraham's other children. Or they're Iranians, the people of Cyrus, who was God's anointed in the book of Isaiah. I believe God has a prophetic purpose for the salvation of Arabs and for Persians and for Muslims generally, the same as he does for the salvation of Israel and the Jews. I really believe that based on Scripture and, and on the witness of the Holy Spirit reading the Scripture. I really believe that. Where is the burden of Christ for these people? You know, there's other groups. It's, 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 it's not such an issue for me. Black Lives Matter make me sick and aggravated. But when I see Candace Owen or somebody I agree with, or Larry Elder, or Dr. Alan Keyes, or Thomas Sowell, I stand up and applaud. I want to kiss the computer screen. Thank God we have people like that. Not just that they're black people who stand up and tell the truth and have moral values, but they're, they're people for, 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 for all of us to look up to. I, I, I love them. I don't have a race. I've never had a race problem. Before I was a kid, I was politically to the left when I was younger. Before I was saved, particularly, I was left-wing, and I was in sympathy with radical blacks. <clears throat> and I, I never had a thing again. Then I was on drugs, and, of course, the drug culture. I used to have to go into the black community and so forth with my cocaine addiction and things like that. I had black friends. I never had a problem with, with black people. It was just ones I liked and ones I didn't, the same as Irish people or Jewish people or Hispanic people. There's ones I liked, ones I didn't. Never had a problem with Hispanics, never had a problem with but Muslims. I don't have a problem with Sikhs, I don't have a problem with Hindus, at least not the ones in England. But God's had to deal with me. How can you love these people who persecute Christians and who hate Israel? But he does. He does. And when I see these few Muslims that I've led to Christ, I know that it was Jesus not only using me, but rebuking and correcting something wrong in my life. I didn't want to go to those people. I didn't want to go to. But the Lord has other plans. Other plans for me? and other plans for you. And if you don't like it, that's okay. The fish is hungry and you're on its menu. It'll happen. If you're serious about following the Lord, about fulfilling God's purpose and plan for your life, he's gonna get you to do it one way or another if you're serious. One, if you are really serious, if you are serious in your commitment to Christ, and in your willingness to do his will. You can get on a ship to Tarshish, but you won't arrive. You're going to Nineveh, wherever your Nineveh may be. It may be the inner cities of Detroit or Baltimore. It may be a foreign mission field. It may be something I have no idea, and maybe you don't have any idea right now. But if you commit your way to the Lord, your plans will be established. God knows. He knows what your calling is. And if you don't want to do it, he has a way of dealing with us. God confronts Noah a second time. Go to Nineveh. Off he goes. Then he went. But bitterness, resentment, anger doesn't let go easily. We all have an old nature. I knew you'd forgive these people. I detested them. That's why I didn't want to come here. Couldn't have gotten somebody else. Oh, it's hot. I'm going to lay down in the sun on the east side of town. And there's a symbolic meaning to the fact that it was on the east side. It was on the east side of Nineveh. That was like the end of known civilization, virtually. Almost. There was a bit in Persia, but not that far north from uh, 
where Nineveh was. It, it's still unexcavated. Nineveh is still unexcavated to this day. Be that as it may, he goes under what is probably a castor tree. The people who study such things, the horticulturists who are Christians, have looked at this and they say it is likely that it blossom quickly and then the worm made it. A bit of comfort when he puts us into difficult circumstances. But then he takes that comfort away. You see, not only did God have to get Jonah to be where he needed Jonah to be to do what he called Jonah to do. He had to change Jonah's heart towards the Ninevites, towards the Assyrians. I know Caucasians that God has to change their hearts towards black people. I know black people, even black Christians, that God has to change their hearts towards Caucasians. I know non-Jews that God has to change their hearts concerning his ancient people, who still are his people. I know people of all kinds of backgrounds, ethnicities. God's had to deal with my heart concerning Muslims. Maybe your heart concerning Asians or Jews or blacks or Caucasians. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He wants to save all of them. Now, they won't all be saved. They won't all repent. But that's their choice, not his preference. No, we're all sons of Jonah. Remember, a sonship in Hebrew thought, Hebraic thought, is not simply pedigree. It is in the character of a son of righteousness. Uh, you know, a uh, son of light. We're sons of Jonah, just like Peter. Both of them at Jaffa, not wanting to go to Gentiles, both of them saddled with their own ethnic and cultural prejudices, and with certain amount of good reason. The Romans were occupying Peter's country. The Assyrians were barbarians. They had what seemed to be good reasons. Muslims persecute Christians wherever they can. I have good reasons according to my own standards. But God's standards? You can call me James. You can call me Jacob. But my name is Jonah. And so is yours. Thank you so much for listening. Hope we see you at Wednesday Bible Study. And we hope we see you here next week with the word for the weekend. RTN and Moriel TV. God bless and thank you so much. Every blessing in Jesus.